um, against Bayern Munich. I have to be completely honest, it's so annoying. So I might as well do my little match review now of the game itself. Um, I think the scoreline and the result definitely flattered us. Bayern Munich 4, Man United 3. I think the result will let you know or will tell you that the game was far closer than what it actually was. But if you actually watched it, you would have felt like Bayern Munich were in second gear, if not third gear, their entire game. And whenever they needed to turn it on, they did. And they usually were a threat on goal. Even though most of their goals came from our mistakes, I still feel like if they wanted to turn it on, they could. Um, one of the biggest compliments I could pay to Bayern Munich is that Harry Kane hardly touched the ball. He hardly got involved. He was hardly a threat. And essentially... The Harry Kane signing for Bayern Munich, it did prove something to me. It proved this theory that I think many people who watch football as much as I do, or maybe watch football more than I do, say the top, top teams don't really need crazy good strikers. Like a Haaland isn't really needed at Man City. You could probably get away with playing, I don't know, Andre Ayew up front for fucking Man City and they'd probably still win the league. Right, You just need someone to score enough goals up front because you've got other players in the team who can contribute. But also the way you play, it's not always focused on that, that one person up front. He's not the only saviour. And I think at United, one of the things that makes our players hard to judge is that there's a lot of pressure on them. There's a lot of onus, a lot of focus put on them and their performance. You know, I could speak about Bruno Fernandes and Marcus Rashford who are blue in the face because they, in my opinion, are a little bit average and they don't really match up to the hype that the fans give them. But there's also a part of me that thinks, you know what, maybe part of the reason is that they've always been the marquee number one player at the club for the last, since basically they've been signed, both of these players, right? Maybe Matt Rashford, even since he's kind of broken through. They've never had the chance to be part of a collective team that, you know, that they can kind of, you know, um, spread the burden of responsibility amongst others. It's always them. And I noticed that with Harry Kane at Bayern Munich. So I'm kind of happy that Harry Kane didn't end up at United because if he would have ended up at United and not scored, we would have been effing and blinding all over the place. Do you know what I mean? Because we would look to him as the only person to score, as the only one to create chances and stuff. It would have been too much, like a Messiah complex thing. So happy that didn't happen. But regardless... The game didn't start off the greatest. We missed a really early chance that we probably should have scored. I think Ericsson's second chance in the area at around two to three minutes was probably a lot easier than Pelestri's chance that was coming into the box. Um, Alfonso Davis got in a really good tackle, which was ironic too, because before the game, Eric Ten Hag said that they were going to focus in on Alfonso Davis's side. That's why Pelestri was playing, because they didn't think he's a good defender, which he obviously displayed in droves and also attacking wise it doesn't really matter if you can defend or not if you're always going to outscore teams like Bayern Munich end up outscoring us in this game so I think Ericsson should have scored um, when the ball then came back out to him he hit straight at the keeper I think that was our chance to kind of take control of the game that didn't happen and then of course we end up making a mistake and Onana ends up not saving a pretty easy meat and potatoes save that he should be making you know 10 times out of 10 Leroy Sane basically does a one two outside the box hits it from about 20 yards but it's quite central it's within you know um Onana's grasp and it somehow goes under his arm I'm not just sure if it hit a divot or something I don't know what happened but luckily for us I don't feel like our heads dropped I'm not gonna lie I felt like our heads didn't drop. And I think we realised this by Munich team aren't as dangerous as they were in the past. They're not as formidable. They're not as scary. So if we would have worked our way back into the game, we probably could have got ourselves back into the game pretty quickly. But it didn't happen. Soon after that, um, they then ended up scoring another goal to make it 2-0. Serge Gnabry this time. Um, a really good run by Musiala inside the box. Um, Owen Hargreaves was glazing Musiala a bit too much. He played well, don't get me wrong. But... Every time I was looking down at my phone to check Twitter and I heard him saying something about Musiala, it was just him running. I would look up and I was expecting him to be doing some crazy shit and it was just him running. Um, but he was talking about him like he was playing like Ronaldinho incarnated. But he does look really good. He's very mature for his age if he's only 18. Um, and the way he receives the ball on a half turn, he kind of reminds me a lot of like, you know, what's his name? Um, Jude Bellingham in that maturity thing. Like them, even though they're both amazing players, the thing that separates both of them from the rest is that they look like men already when they're playing. They don't make dumb, idiotic, young player decisions on the pitch or inexperienced decisions. They usually, nine times out of ten, make the right pass. They're always looking for a man. They're not greedy like Rashford is and shit. And that's what basically people are impressed by, their overall maturity and their IQ. So Musiala was good. He drives into the box. I thought Dada did pretty well to keep up with him. I don't think he should have gone in for the tackle. I think other people are thinking differently. But I think he did well to kind of keep up with him and... 
um, wait for him in a box. But then I think Lindelof and the rest of the defenders, they immediately just squared up and put their hands behind the ball, behind their back. They didn't engage him in the slightest when he stopped. And I think that was the main issue. He was able to stop, look up, pick Serge Gnabry and then cut it back and then bang 2-0 before half time. So that clearly was the biggest um, wake up call for us as a team. Uh, I think at half time, most of us fans, including myself, were basically saying, okay, this is going to end up being like, you know, in the high fives. Um, and then, of course, luckily, we end up getting a goal straight after half time, And that gave us a bit of confidence that we were maybe going to get back into the game. But again, our lack of composure, our lack of maturity, our lack of organisation, Bruno Fernandes, no leadership, nothing to just settle our nerves down after the good goal from Rasmus Hoyland. Bit of a deflection there, but I think he deserved that goal for all the running that he did. A um, little concern with Rasmus Hoyland is that I feel like as much as he's a willing runner, he doesn't really make a lot of intelligent runs. Um, he seems to run into spaces, but he's not running in. He's not kind of, I don't know. He, he doesn't, he's not like making little checked runs like a, like Vardy at his pumped would do. Um, but then again, I think maybe it's because he's so new to a team, no one really knows, you know, what he's up to and whatnot, which is again concerning because you'd imagine if you're going to spend that kind of money on a young player, you should have a plan about how you're going to play him. But at the moment, it doesn't really seem like it. It seems like Rasha does his thing, Pleasure does his thing. And then, you know, Hoyland has just feeding the scraps. So the fact that Hoyland is feeding on, or Hoyland is really feeding on scraps and he's doing what he's doing, give him props. So he deserved that goal. So well done for him. He gets a goal. And then you think we're going to settle down and maybe get another one to draw, but we don't. Um, we, again, let the game kind of drive by. We pull out tackles. We're just being crazy and just leaving too much space on the pitch, which I didn't like again. I feel like there was way too much space on that pitch. I don't know why it always looks like our team is completely spread out all over it. There's no real compactness to us. Our defenders always look exposed. Our midfielders always look rushed. Everything just doesn't look well organized. I'm not really sure whose fault that is, but that's the main problem. And what I noticed was that Casemiro was getting caught alone being the one and only screen in front of the back four. Ericsson, I don't know where he was, but Casemiro was getting exposed a lot and it kind of made him look worse than probably he was. He played uh, because he had to run around and sort of put out various fires and play catch up, but he still managed to score two goals. You know, That's the crazy thing about this game. It didn't really make any sense because I don't think Casemiro played too well, but he still managed to score two goals. So anyway, um, they didn't get a penalty. Handball was very dubious, like weird handball. Um, they're in the box. And I think someone heads it down. It hits Ericsson's arm, but he's literally like right in front of the player. Odd free, odd penalty, but it happens. It's Europe. Cool. Kane slots it in. You don't, you don't really expect um, Onana to save it. It's now 3-1 and you're expecting a bit of a routing and then out of the blue we end up scoring a goal to make it free to Casemiro kind of scuffs it in or scums it in and then again you think you were going to hold on but then again you know Bayern Munich show their quality they bring on Matt, uh, Matthias Tell and he ends up scoring a pretty decent volley in the box after controlling on his knee and then Casemiro gets a final goal at the end so uh, you know the result didn't seem too bad but performance wasn't the greatest no cohesion no real big leadership the control in the midfield is really stinky I'm not really liking the partnership of Lindelof and Martinez I think one person I don't think they both engage well. This is something I'm going to say is really odd. I think as great as Martinez is on the front foot and aggressive as he is, I really don't think he engages well. He kind of needs somebody a bit steady next to him to kind of maybe make him look better. I'm not too sure. It's a bit odd. Or maybe he's going through a hard time. Lindelof, we know what he's like. He just doesn't like a tackle. He's not someone that's going to be in there like wanting to do a dogged fight. He seems to get his, he seems to get ragdoll a lot or he's spinning a lot or he looks lost. So I'm not really too fond of that. I thought Regulon again was one of our better players. He's been maybe the man that match for us two games in a row um he looks like he's coming in wanting to earn a contract and wanting to stay at the club permanently so respect to him for that but it's just refreshing to see us have a left back that's running up and down the line right that's overlapping that is available further down the pitch across the ball in and seems to be willing to do it now again his fitness levels aren't going to last all game because he's just excited to be there now i'm sure he'll level out but it's refreshing. It's a complete difference from like Luke Shaw, who's always cutting the ball back, who's always squaring the ball, who always looks slow, who just doesn't look like he wants to attack or wants to run, you know, up, go up and down that line. And so, and obviously, Malashia probably doesn't have the best quality when it comes to attack, but he's a willing runner. So, Reguilon has been a breath, breath of fresh air and something I didn't really rate or want, but credit to him for smashing it. Um, and then Onana, I'm going to say I feel kind of bad for him. I don't think any of us ever thought he was going to be an amazing shot stopper. Um, so I don't think anybody kind of freaking out and thinking, oh, why is he not saving stuff like David De Gea? So should we probably get their head tested? But the thing that's really concerning me about Onana is more so how we play. 
we we bought him specifically for because of how good he is with the ball at his feet, which is demonstrated. But we're not really using it to our you know advantage. We have not really seen a ball yet to Rasmus Hoyland from Onana straight through the middle, run him running onto it because I think he'd be good at that. Right, he's done that before at Atalanta. So that's a concerning. Um, there's no real composure or t- really high level technical ability on the ball from any of our quartet or midfielders that are kind of fought, you know in front of him. So when he's passing the ball out, it kind of feels like he has to rush to get to these guys. Whereas before, you'd imagine if you're playing with a goalkeeper that can play the ball at their feet, you can pass the ball at your leisure to the people in midfield because everybody's comfortable with it. It doesn't really happen. So because we're not using him to his advantage or to his skill set, we're now focusing in on the thing that he's not the best at, which is shot stopping. And there are some shots that go in for us when you watch them on a replay, you're like, oh, David De Gea would have definitely saved that, right? They're like shots that a good goalkeeper, a high level goalkeeper saves, but maybe one that plays the ball at their feet more often doesn't. But I also think, unfortunately for Anana, this newer era of goalkeepers that exist now, they have the whole package, right? They can save like David De Gea and they can play with the ball at their feet like Edison. So he kind of is looking a bit stinky because of that. So maybe a lot of the coaching staff need to take a look at their heads and wonder why they didn't sign another goalkeeper like the Diogo guy, the Diogo, um, is it Diogo Carlos? I forgot his name. And the, the Portuguese goalkeeper, he might have been a good option. Maybe a few others, I'm not too sure. Maybe that's why we signed that Turkish guy um, to kind of be second fiddle. Who knows? But that's a little bit concerning. But then when he come out after the game and gave an interview or specifically requested to speak to CBS, I think, I think that told us everything about his mentality. So I'm not really worried about his mental state and whatnot. I think he's going to be fine from now on. I just don't want to see those mistakes happening too often. Um, but then again, as like I said, the team is playing so badly right now, you can never just pin it on one player. There are no scapegoats. It's everybody. But the two main leaders in Marcus Rashford and Bruno Fernandes, they're the ones that are really concerning me because you look at how, um, you look at how flipping Odegaard performed for Arsenal the other day against PSV and you think about the fact that they both have the same number, number eight, so they're both captains of their team. And you think about how Bruno Fernandes has spoken about in the media and how people lord on his lord over his goals and assists and his stats. And then you see about how quietly, you know, Odegaard goes about doing his job. It makes you wonder, like, is Rashford, is Bruno Fernandes actually better than Odegaard? I don't think so, personally. I never have thought so. And I think Bruno Fernandes might be a bit of a stat padder. He might have been one of those people who legitimately has, you know, increase his profile mostly based on his goals and assists but when you actually watch him against top level opponents he's not that good he doesn't influence games he doesn't impact games he doesn't take control of games in the slightest and if anything all he does is provide moments and I think Rashford and Bruno Fernandes are those kind of players and I think personally for myself I would much rather see a team I would much rather see a scenario where Eric Ten Hag decides to drop one or either of those guys but at the moment we have two players on our team that cannot get dropped and I think that's a not a good way to go about things when we're already struggling maybe you can carry one player who's a moments player like as we did maybe with Ronaldo back in the day but I don't think you can do that with two you can't have two players on the pitch who you have to carry who aren't going to track back who aren't going to work as hard but they might have moments because if that's the case you know why are you requesting Sancho to apologize to you because it's clear that that's part of the reason why he's probably pissed off he probably thinks he's training well or if he doesn't think he's training well, he's probably thinking, what's the point of me training well if you're always going to pick Anthony, if you're always going to play Rashford, if you're never going to sub them off early enough for me to impact the game. Even if I score a hat-trick, I'll be on the bench again next game. That's the issue I'm having. Um, Ericsson Hag's refusal to think of options for those two. And now people say, oh, there's no options on the bench. Yes, there are. You select players on the bench because you want to play them. I don't care if it's Hannibal playing there, if it's fucking Daniel Gore, I do not care. You put them on the bench for a reason, so play them. That's the thing. And if you don't trust these players, go and sign better ones as options. But I don't believe in this. Oh, because they're the only ones available, just play them. Because I personally do think that just play the best players who are available despite their form has negatively impacted the um, the vibe in the changing room. Because I've played at least Sunday league level. It's nothing close to professional football. But I know when you play Sunday league level and there's favourites, it does negatively impact the dressing room because people know it doesn't matter how hard they go in training on Wednesdays or it doesn't matter how good they play when they come on a sub, the manager's favourite, the uncle, the son, whoever this guy is related to the coach, they're always going to play. And that's not the right way to go about things, in my personal humble opinion. And I'd much rather see us try other solutions. And the other thing for me as well is, 
Eric Ten Hag has to be careful because I don't want him to get fired personally. Even though I don't rate him as a coach, and I think he basically, you know, is a bit of a catfish. He sold us one thing when he was at Ajax, and he comes into United, and it's completely different. I still think if if Ericsson Hall gets sacked before the owners leave, it's going to excuse the players again, who I think are the major culprits at this club. After that interview with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer in the week with the Atlantic, it's clear to see that that club is toxic and the players have way too much power. They have way too much influence on getting rid of the managers. And for me, even though some of the managers deserve to leave, I think these players are in no position to dictate anything or any terms to anybody. So the fact that they are is stinky. And we need to get rid of those players first. But usually clubs don't do that because it's more expensive to cancel contracts with players and get rid of them than it is to sack one manager. So that's why, selfishly, I want Eric Ten Hag to figure it out so that when we do get a takeover and, you know, Eric Ten Hag maybe eventually has to leave, it still means if we get a takeover and these players stay and he stays, most likely these players will get sold, you know, because he will definitely be in, encouraged to just make some sweeping changes and get rid of the players that he doesn't want and then start again and rebuild the club in his image. Cool, no problem. But I don't want him to give the players an excuse. So please, for the love of God, Eric Ten Hag, figure it the fuck out. Figure out some solutions to get this team working. Maybe change the formation. Maybe this four-two-three-one thing isn't working. Maybe try something else, um, especially with the players you have available. Um, because he's already complaining that he does, he's never had to play his full starting eleven. But injuries happen in football. It is what it is. You have to figure out solutions, especially at this level. You can't be. You don't automatically get given grace. You have to earn that grace. At the moment, Ayrton Hag isn't owning it. So, you know, all in all, um, terrible result, terrible performance, way more questions than answers. And if anything, it just kind of highlights how far we are, again, from the top teams because we're most likely going to end up bottom, if not near bottom of our fucking group. Um, and you're wondering then, what's the point of us even qualifying for the Champions League when we're not really going to pull up any trees, you know? It's going to be a pretty crazy and embarrassing time when we go to these other stadiums or these other grounds we face Galatasaray and Copenhagen and we realise just how far away we are and we end up in the Europa League again, which I absolutely abhor. So continuing on from that, we also got some other news. Um, again, Onana gave an interview after the game, basically owning up to his mistakes, saying it's the one of the worst um, games he's ever played. So that obviously tells me the mentality is good from him. He takes accountability, he takes ownership, he takes responsibility. So I don't have any concerns. Um, it's the complete opposite of Harry Maguire, complete opposite of Bruno Fernandes at times. And I'm glad to hear him say that because, yes, it was um, a horrible group of mistakes and stuff and bad performance. But I don't think that we lost because it was his fault. I think in general, we're just not playing well enough um, to ever trouble a team like Bayern Munich. But anyway, he said to TNT Sport, it's difficult to lose this way as we started very good, but after my mistake, we lost control of the game. It's a difficult situation for us and me as I let the team down. The team was already was really good, but it was because of me we didn't win this. I don't think we were really good. I think we were still in the game. Don't get me wrong. We had the chance in the beginning, but I don't think we played really good. Um, I think Bayern Munich gave us a lot of opportunities to score because they just don't care about defending. And I think that Upa Mancano is essentially their version of Harry Maguire like he's terrible he's very rash he kind of he's even worse than Eric Bailly to be fair in terms of how rash he is um so they were giving away loads of stuff and I think even a left back I forgot who his name what's their what's their left back called the guy that was playing left back was also making a lot of errors sorry the right back sorry um Lima like it wasn't a good it wasn't a good um team from them to be fair so um, I wouldn't say we played amazing um, he continues and says, Onana, I'm happy for the work of the team, but we have to move on. And that is life of a goalkeeper. We didn't win today because of me. There's a first shot on target. I made a mistake. So the team went down because of the mistake. I have to learn, be strong and move on. Although um, it's not easy situation. I'm happy for the comeback of the team. We're fighting until the end. So good to hear him saying, own up to that sort of stuff. But I need, I need just to see on the pitch. I hope this doesn't be a normal uh, uh, a constant occasion do you know what I mean um, one more thing he says I have a lot to prove my start in Manchester has not been good or how I want the The way I played today was one of my worst games it's difficult as we're a big club who wants to win everything it was a good opportunity to bounce back but after the situation we are facing it's a tough time we have to be together and continue to work so let's, let's wait and see 
Um, it's not looking encouraging. The rumours about black goalkeepers are going to continue with Andre Onana, to be honest. Um, it's one of those things you just have to kind of, you know, own up and hold your hands up and say maybe the scouting wasn't the greatest on this one. But I still think we are putting too much onus on his goalkeeping. He was never going to be David De Gea in goal. He was never a brilliant shot stopper. The thing that we brought him in for was his ability to play with the ball at his feet. And now we're not using him for that, which is why we're seeing what we're seeing. And he's being relied upon as a normal goalkeeper, which he obviously isn't. He's definitely um, is kind of hurting us in that regard. So let's see how it plays out. I'm rooting for the kid and I hope it works out for us in some way, shape or form going forward.